On this Friday night, Donald Trump seems to open up a new front in his fight to get a Supreme Court justice on the bench, using new language about his nominee's accuser that seems to accuse her instead. We'll look at how women in the U.S. and Canada fired back on Twitter, just the latest development in a high-stakes nomination. Also tonight, a tornado rips a terrible path through parts of Ontario and Quebec. We'll show you the devastation left behind to homes and communities, and we'll hear from those who watched it happen. This is The National. It is the kind of disaster you just don't see coming. But for many people in the Ottawa area, looking around at what's left, it's painfully easy to see. It hit hard. Homes have been reduced to rubble after a powerful tornado tore a long path through the region. That's our unit over there. And uh, when it ripped our roof, my daughter, she went flying up and I'm holding her hand in the air. And I almost let go because she was slipping and I said, if she's going to die, I'm going to die with her. And then it finally went fast. That happened in Gatineau, Quebec. And you can see just how powerful the storm was with pieces of this apartment building left in a twisted pile. Investigators are still working to trace the tornado's exact path. But we know that before hitting Gatineau, it tore through part of Ottawa. Take a look. This is Dunrobin in the city's west end. Entire homes scattered. The latest we're getting right now from officials there is that about 100 homes were damaged, 30 people have been hurt, and most of them, about 25, are children. Also, at least five people have serious injuries. And paramedics say they received calls from people who were trapped as well, sometimes in their homes, sometimes in their cars. But all those images you just saw were from after the storm. Take a look at this. Incredible video captured the moment the tornado hit. really gives you a sense of just how scary it was in the one place you did not want to be. CBC News meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff is here. And Joe, can you tell us, what do we know about this storm? Well, Andrew, this was a significant tornado. Environment Canada confirming at least one touchdown. There may have been two, or this may have just been a very long track tornado uh, hopping up and down as it moved from Dunrobin to the North Gatineau region. In fact, I've got a picture to show you where those two reports and visual pictures we have of that tornado. So again, that's about 20 kilometer long track. Environment Canada will be heading to the scene tomorrow to assess the damage. Based on what myself and other meteorologists have seen, though, uh, this is a significant tornado with sustained winds uh, around the center, likely between 180 and 220 kilometers per hour. And Andrew, also rain wrapped, so very hard to see at the time. And Joe, how common are tornadoes in this particular area? Well, this is peak of tornado season, the clash of the seasons. Often we see the most of them in the beginning to mid-September. This is actually part of one of our tornado alleys, one that runs through the southern prairies and another that runs from southern Ontario right through to southern Quebec. In Ontario, uh, we see about 12 to 13 tornadoes a year. It's still very rare, though, to get one affect a large community like this, Andrew. Yeah, and and no less devastating to to live through that. Uh, Johanna Wagstaff, thanks so much. You're welcome. Let's turn to an ongoing public conversation. You might have heard a lot of people engaged in it today on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border. It's about sexual assault and the meaning of consent and how we should think about and talk about those who break their silence to tell their stories. On social media, a tweet by the U.S. president seemed to spark much of it. The hashtag, why I didn't report, exploded with women and men disclosing intimate details of their lives, explaining that They were too young, too ashamed, too fearful of what might happen if they came forward. So we'll share some of those with you in a moment. But first, the CBC's Ellen Morrow outlines how Donald Trump seemed to incite such an overwhelming response, his insinuation about a woman who did come forward, and how it's all connected to his Supreme Court nominee. We have to fight for him, not worry about the other side. And by the way, women are for that more than anybody would understand. For days, President Trump has been restrained in his comments on the Kavanaugh case. That's now changing. 
Today on Twitter, the president went after Kavanaugh's accuser, Christine Blasey Ford, writing that he has no doubt that if the attack was as bad as she says, charges would have been immediately filed. He also wrote that Kavanaugh is under assault by radical left-wing politicians who don't want the answers. They just want to destroy and delay. Susan Collins, a moderate Republican whose vote is crucial to Kavanaugh's confirmation, called Trump's tweet about Ford appalling. The president had previously been careful not to attack Ford. We want to give tremendous amounts of time. If she shows up, that would be wonderful. But he began to harden his language last night. Why didn't somebody call the FBI 36 years ago? I mean, you could also say, when did this all happen? What's going on? Uh, to take a man like this and be smirched. Now, with that being said, let her have her say. And it's not just the president taking a harder line. While many Republicans say they want the truth, the party's top senator implied Kavanaugh will be confirmed no matter what. You've watched the fight. You've watched the tactics. But here's what I want to tell you. In the very near future, Judge Kavanaugh will be on the United States Supreme Court. Kavanaugh himself has spent the week at the White House preparing his defense. The hearing will be about this sexual assault allegation, but all of this latest maneuvering shows it will also come down to a bitter partisan battle with a lifetime seat on the Supreme Court at stake. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Washington. So as we mentioned, after the president's tweet this morning, the hashtag, why I didn't report, started trending both in the United States and here in Canada with thousands of women and men explaining to Donald Trump and others inclined to question Judge Kavanaugh's accuser why not reporting doesn't mean that nothing happened. We want to share a few of those tweets with you as read by some of our colleagues. So have a listen because the reasons for not reporting are as varied as those who offer them. But some themes stand out. For some, not reporting has been about a lack of faith in the justice system. Because I didn't want to be put on trial and publicly smeared. Last Friday, I had a police officer ask me why I didn't report about an assault that happened 10 plus years ago. What's happening right now surrounding Kavanaugh is why. Others say they didn't report because they blamed themselves. I felt so stupid putting myself in the position where it could happen. Because I didn't fight or scream. I just prayed it would be over as quickly as possible and then thought my lack of protest would be considered consent. Only in the past couple of years am I able to admit to myself that it was assault that happened 27 years ago. Then there are those people tweeting about incidents that happened when they were so young. My mom said she would kill anyone who hurt me, and at nine years old, I believed her. I was afraid she would go to jail. Because I literally didn't know there was a word for what happened. It wasn't until years later that I learned there was a word for what I experienced. And of course, so many assaults involve people in positions of trust, reporting that so much easier said than done. Because he was a close friend who I had been supporting through his breakup, because I had been drinking, because I couldn't believe that it had happened, because I've been conditioned to believe I asked for it. That was 1,784 days ago. Because he was my partner and I thought I loved him. I thought he made a mistake and I sympathize with him instead of prioritizing myself. Finally, many people today use the why I didn't report hashtag to say the opposite, that they had reached out for help. Here's one. I did call. They called it mischief. I slept with a knife. One more note on this story. The chair of the U.S. Senate Judiciary says a vote on Kavanaugh's nomination will be held on Monday if a deal can't be reached with Ford to testify before the committee. We mentioned that the idea of consent was part of many conversations today. In Ontario, it was high school students driving it. Thousands walked out of their classes in protest over the provincial government's decision to replace a recent sex ed curriculum with a much older one. The decision seems to have inspired a new generation of young activists. And as Salima Shivji explains, they want to make sure their voices are heard. At this Toronto school, the outrage over changes to the province's sex ed curriculum spills onto the streets. We do not! We Organized do not. under the banner, We the Students Do Not Consent, a reference to the fact that sexual consent is no longer being taught in class. Students are not lazy. We're not going to sit back and 
watch our education be destroyed. But these are high school students. The reversal to the old 1998 sex ed course affects elementary schools only. Still, these kids say they need to stand up for their younger friends. Kids do uh, need to learn about gender expression and gender identities and different kinds of families and all that, and it's really irresponsible to, uh, to cut that out. The walkout wasn't confined to Toronto. Dozens of high schools across the province emptied out in Oakville, Guelph, Kingston, Ottawa. In all dozens of schools, thousands of students, a sign of how important this issue is for many. Huh, like the kids are protesting about this. It must be something important because why would they care so much about it? But for some, the fight is personal. They say an outdated sex ed curriculum that ignores consent and same-sex relationships can have serious consequences, spreading ignorance. As a member of the LGBT community, when I come out to people, the response isn't always positive. And leaving young people in the dark and unprepared for the world around them. I did not fully understand what consent was. It hadn't been talked about when I was in grade 8. And I found it very, very helpful because I was sexually assaulted and I did not understand that it was not okay. Their message to the Premier, governing for the people, means governing for young people too. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Toronto. Ontario's Minister of Education, Lisa Thompson, declined our request for an interview, but her office said they encourage every interested person in Ontario to participate in the province-wide education consultations set to begin next week. Here's what else we're digging into tonight. Could health information gathered on your wearable device be used against you by insurance companies? As the federal government moves to kickstart the Trans Mountain Pipeline, we'll look at why the project may have environmentalists divided. But first, Ottawa is also responding to a CBC Marketplace investigation into a phone scam that has cost Canadians millions of dollars. At least 60,000 Canadians have been targeted. They received threatening phone calls saying they owe money and that they have to pay it back immediately or face severe consequences. David Common tracked the scammers down in India where police made a surprising claim. Listen to this. Nobody contacted us from Canada. You're telling me 60,000 people at least have complained in Canada sure. and nobody from Canada no, has told nobody you con anything? Nobody contacted us. We asked the RCMP directly about the Indians' assertion. They did not offer an explanation, wouldn't talk on camera, but did send a statement saying fraud is a global problem and the best way to combat these types of crimes is through prevention and public awareness. Yeah, David, that's a stunning thing to hear, especially considering the size of, of this scam. What struck you when you heard it? We were really surprised when those words came out of his mouth, in part because of who he is. He's one of the most senior Indian police commissioners in the country. He told us his officers were, right at that moment, ready to crack down on these CRA scammers who were targeting Canadians but not without help from the RCMP and information from the RCMP. So we have been pressing the RCMP for more than two months for a response to that assertion. Never got one until, of course, the story aired last night on The National. And then today, the federal government responded in a statement. Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale said, most definitely continuing to work with India's law enforcement agencies on these complaints. Okay, a little short on details there. Uh, did the government give any indication of what that work actually looks like? No, no indication of what it looks like, of who they're talking to, about what might happen. We do know this, though, that in all of our conversations with multiple Indian police officials, nobody ever said anything about arrests or raids targeting those scam centres that are themselves targeting Canadians. One, also, one thing we also know is that when the Americans complained and paired up with the Indian police, there was quite quickly a massive raid and large numbers of arrests. That's not something we've seen with the scam centers targeting Canadians. Okay, I know you're gonna stay on it. David, thanks very much. Thank you. Now, overseas phone scams probably weren't what the government wanted to focus on today. They might have preferred to talk about the Trans Mountain Pipeline. The Liberals took the first step on a long road back for the project left in limbo by a court decision last month, announcing a new environmental review aimed at BC's sensitive coast. But to critics, it is a move that 
rings hollow because, they say, the government has already made up its mind. David Cochran is watching developments. They bought the pipeline and all of the problems that came with it. Then a federal court stopped it in its tracks. Obviously, this decision was disappointing, but by no means insurmountable. Very little is insurmountable when you're the federal government, you own the project, and you ultimately decide if it goes ahead. So critics say restarting consultations to satisfy a court order is really just ticking a box. Justin Trudeau has already made up his mind on this project. He wants this pipeline, he insists this pipeline is going to be built. Boosting pipeline capacity to the B.C. coast will also boost tanker traffic. The National Energy Board now has until February to assess the environmental impact that will have, notably on endangered killer whales. Environmentalists warn there is no meaningful way to mitigate that impact and that this timeline is too rushed. The Premier of Alberta, who faces an election in the spring, sees it differently. Our focus now is to ensure that the timeline is set in stone. That's the issue. And if it starts to slip and the goalposts shift, I can assure you that the voices of Albertans will be loud. Today, there are no timelines for shovels in the ground, no timeline for completion, no timeline for jobs. And there are other big timelines at play, getting this all done in time for the 2019 construction season and making meaningful progress on the pipeline for the federal election next fall. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the other concern the court raised was consultation with Indigenous groups. The government suggested a plan to do that was coming, but one First Nations leader says the court's decision speaks for itself. In our view, it um, sounds like yet another sham process and uh, somewhat insane. We're going down the same rabbit hole that the Trudeau government attempted to go down at the outset when he promised to restructure the NEB process. Now, many anti-pipeline activists hope Trans Mountain is permanently put on hold, but not all environmentalists agree. As the CBC's Aaron Collins reports, some say if it doesn't get built, the alternative could be worse. For those opposed to the Trans Mountain pipeline expansion, the day construction stopped was a day to celebrate. It's a great day today. We won. A day when the steady beat of opposition to the project paid off. But not all environmentalists think that is a good thing. Author Chris Turner has written extensively about the oil sands. He also ran for the Green Party in 2012. Is it a big win for the actual environment? No, I don't think it's a big win. I think there's some small victories maybe, uh, some near-term victories in terms of coastal marine protection, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, uh, getting better due diligence in place. But a big win on the big issue of climate change, I, I just don't see it. I don't see a victory here. In the short term, production and emissions from the oil sands will continue to increase with or without the line. And more of it will move through Canada's cities and towns by rail. So if you've got, you know, a few hundred thousand more barrels a day coming from the new Fort Hills project being opened, it's going to find its way to market. They've already dug in on that. The investment is made. The oil's being produced. If it has to go on a train, it'll go on a train. And so it is. Oil by rail reached an all-time high this summer, moving more than 200,000 barrels a day, a trend that will continue if the Trans Mountain project dies. A project Alberta Premier Rachel Notley has gambled her political future on. And if she loses that bet, a Conservative government in Alberta could scrap the province's carbon tax, new limits on oil sands expansion, and a plan to phase out coal. The consequence of it is, is quite dire. If, uh, if we change course, uh, the, uh, the opposition party in Alberta seems to signal that they want to go back to the old days. Those were not good old days. But for some, stopping the Trans Mountain expansion is worth the risk. If this pipeline goes through, it will dramatically increase the capacity of the oil sands. And that means new, bigger development in the oil sands at a time when we know that we have to be reducing em emissions. Environmentalists agree Canada needs to move away from a carbon-based economy quickly. The question is whether stopping the Trans Mountain expansion helps or hurts those efforts. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Lots more ahead tonight on The National. We investigate golden visas and find some wealthy immigrants are taking advantage of a special Quebec program.
Also, how a problem from 50 years ago could actually be one city's fix for dealing with stormwater. And would you let your insurance company tap into your Fitbit if you could get a discount? I think, honestly, a lot of people will just because it is an incentive. They track your physical activity, what you eat, and even how well you sleep. But there's something else devices like Fitbits do. They create a dilemma about all that sensitive data and who has access to it. A major insurance company in the U.S. has now switched over to what it calls interactive policies. The company monitors policyholders via their fitness trackers and rewards good choices with discounts. No surprise, perhaps, privacy advocates are sounding the alarm. And as Cameron McIntosh tells us, it's happening here too. Just a little jump, there you go, wrist and all. John Brown knows all about motivation. That a girl. Some praise here. Run. A little push there. You were faster than her. So the notion of letting your life insurance company tap into your Fitbit, Garmin, or Apple Watch to track your fitness for a break on a premium is intriguing. I think, honestly, a lot of people will just because it is an incentive. Now your policy can pay you back for living healthy. In the U.S., it's exactly what John Hancock Insurance is doing, making fitness tracking an option on all of its life insurance policies. A program called Vitality, where users submit fitness data from tracking devices for premium discounts and other incentives. Hancock is wholly owned by Canada's Manulife Insurance, which also offers it here. We're really excited about the potential. Um, but right now, we're not saying that it's going to be a requirement. We actually make it an option to those customers to choose it. Manulife is Canada's largest insurer. It says Vitality has a 40% opt-in rate so far. It's up to the user, and it's around the customer deciding that there's real benefits from engaging and getting the rewards and also getting the benefits of feeling healthier and more active. Even if it's voluntary, privacy advocates worry the data could be used to deny coverage. It's really important that we stop sleepwalking towards a surveillance society where we think that by allowing people to watch us and track us, that it's going to make our lives better. Manulife says it uses the data to reward good choices, but won't use it to raise premiums. You can do this. Back at the gym, Brown's Where's not quite way? sold. The devil is in the details. Fit, he says, is different for everyone. Because everybody's built different ways. A fitness tracker could be just the beginning. Insurance companies are also looking at other emerging technologies, like apps that can detect smoking gestures, even ways to use smart speakers in people's homes. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Now, for all the debate over perks versus privacy, it's worth pointing out this kind of program isn't entirely new. Canadian drivers already have something similar. It's called Telematics. Launched a few years ago, it monitors you behind the wheel, promising discounts for being an angel on the road, so to speak. Drivers agree to have a so-called black box installed in their vehicle. It records driving habits, like speeding, slamming on the brakes, how fast you take corners, that sort of thing. I find it hard to believe that uh, the insurers are going to use this solely for premium reduction. But as with Vitality, some privacy advocates cried big brother when it came out. So most provincial governments imposed tough rules forbidding insurance companies from overcharging bad drivers. You can get a discount for good behavior or otherwise pay the standard premiums, but that's it. No financial punishment allowed with all this new information companies could have on you. So has telematics transformed the auto insurance game? Well, not really. Providers say it is still little more than a niche product for a relatively small group of consumers. And still ahead on The National, a community in Nova Scotia is looking 50 years into the past to fix a major problem now. And our moment of the day, the first meeting between a Humboldt Bronco survivor and his new service dog. It'll be amazing just to have someone around all the time and I'm going through hard times or anything like that, you know, he'll he'll be right by my side. Hey, buddy. There you go. Oh, my. <laughs> we are going in depth tonight into the world of so-called golden visas, a story of some 
wealthy immigrants to this country accused of taking advantage of a special Quebec program and the Canadians who helped them do that. Our colleagues with the Radio Canada program Enquête went undercover with a hidden camera to reveal how it all works. Frederick Zalak has the details and what this means for Canadians. Southeast Asia, a favorite location for a booming industry. Countries sell their passports or permanent residency to millionaires. They are called golden visas. They allow the rich easier travel and open doors to South Africa countries, including Canada. It's about having the opportunity in the future, should you want to get out of China and should you want to pack up and leave, to have that opportunity, to have the passport or to have the children with passports. But in some cases, these visas are being blamed for facilitating tax evasion, corruption or money laundering. Since Asia is the largest pool of wealthy migrants, many immigration lawyers and consultants have set up shop in Hong Kong to recruit them. We traveled here to check out, with a hidden camera, how one of the most popular golden visa programs in the world is sold. The one opening the door to Canada, it's called the Quebec Immigrant Investor Program. Back in 1986, the province of Quebec was the very first in the world to sell permanent residency to foreign millionaires in exchange for investment. Those immigrants lend $1.2 million to the province as an interest-free loan for five years. Quebec invests and uses the money generated to dole out grants to small and medium-sized businesses. But there is one big problem. Even though they must state their intention to settle in Quebec, most of those immigrants don't. According to Quebec government's own statistics, less than 20% stay in the province. Immigration lawyer Jean-François Harvey. It's a secret of the that 95% if not more, I'd say that 95% of the people don't stay in Quebec. Just one example. Beijing millionaire Zhao Jingli was granted permanent residency through the Quebec program. Her immigration files show her stated destination was supposed to be Montreal. But when she and her family got her official landing in Canada in 2006, she didn't even bother flying to Quebec. Instead, the family spent 10 days in Vancouver, then flew right back to China, where her husband was a partner in a law firm. I think the Quebec Immigrant Investor Program is a scam from start to finish. Ian Young is the Vancouver-based correspondent of the South China Morning Post, a daily published in Hong Kong. He has been investigating these millionaire migrants for years and the role of the Quebec Immigrant Investor Program. And I think that everyone who's involved in the program knows that. You know, I think that, that includes policymakers, the people who facilitate it, uh, and, and the immigrants themselves. I mean, they know that it, it, it doesn't serve the purpose that it is supposed to serve. In 2014, Zhao Jing Li did finally settle in Canada, not in Quebec, but in Vancouver. Her husband stayed in China to continue his law practice. She bought this $5 million house in West Vancouver with breathtaking views of English Bay, a five-bedroom, seven-washroom mansion for her and her two sons. The Quebec program has been the biggest component of uh, millionaire migration, wealth migration here in Vancouver and in Canada. Uh, and that's a huge component of what's propelling property prices. Um, you look at properties that are worth, you know, five, six million dollars, um, you know, that's not to do with local incomes. While Quebec has been benefiting, British Columbia is stuck with the costs, health care, education, and pressure on the real estate market. The house is now valued at $7.7 .7 million. And there's little revenue to the BC government since the millionaire migrants often remain in China, sending money tax-free to their families living in Canada. Zhao Jing Li paid only $69 in income tax in 2016. We've come to Hong Kong to see for ourselves what recruiters, immigration lawyers and consultants sell to prospective clients. So we created our own millionaire, Mr. Chen, a character whose wealth did have dubious origins, a pawn shop. And our Mr. Chen did not want to settle in Quebec. 
佢審核你嘅，<笑>最好就唔好答得咁明顯，就話你唔會打算長遠喺嗰邊。Oh. Canadian law allows permanent residents to move freely once in Canada, but when they apply to the Quebec program, they must sign documents stating their firm intention to settle in the province. Here is Quebec lawyer Sébastien Guimier practicing in Hong Kong. Okay, look, a lot of people, what they do is rent an apartment for three months in Quebec here, and then they receive the card and then do whatever you want. But worst case, you can always give our office address or something like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We tell their clients to rent an apartment because it looks better. If you give the lawyer's office, they might question, but we never got a problem. And to be honest, to rent an apartment for three months in Montreal, <laughs> It's not a lot of money at this point. 即係通過咗佢就會 OK 嘅，冇乜意思。It also means that they don't have to actually live in that flat. And he's OK. And he's OK. It's a postal address. We show this to Montreal-based immigration lawyer Hugues Langlais. So if, in order to comply for the initial element, that is the intent to reside, you create you create addresses, you create phony. Uh, living arrangement, then you do not meet the requirement of the initial intent to reside. And also you're participating to the fabrication of evidence for the purpose of meeting the obligation to reside, which is the second aspect. In an email, Sébastien Guimier told us he followed the law. He said someone's intention to live in Quebec could have changed by the time they came to Canada. In his advice to rent that apartment, that was just to have a mailing address for receiving the permanent residency card in case the immigrant had to fly back to China while waiting for it. We are now the leading firm with regards to citizenship by investment. Another red flag involved Harvey Law Group, a Hong Kong-based firm founded by Quebec lawyer Jean-François Harvey. Government rules require that all assets and their origins be declared but not if you listen to the advice by this employee. You want to disclose the minimum possible, right? Yeah, okay, yes, it's possible. <laughs> yeah, because there was a She suggests hiding problematic assets in the Caribbean. Caribbean passport also gives him a, a new TIN number, so a tax identity number. Mm -hmm. So that could be useful for him too. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the Caribbean countries does not have a treaty with China, so you get a new tax identity, but they, you don't need to declare to Chinese government of those assets that you have. So with some of this money, I'm not very convenient to disclose. I'm sorry, whether, you know, it's normal. <laughs> we have a lot of clients like that. It's, it's actually really normal. Uh-huh, because he's just opting those money by, like, by Guanxi, you know. Yes, <laughs> yeah. It's not, I'm not a tax official. Mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer to process for immigration. Écoutez, vous m'ouvrez les yeux aussi, hein, quand même, parce qu'il voit qu'il y a des choses qu'il dit qu'il ne devrait pas se dire. Mais d'un autre côté, il y a un processus au bureau aussi. Ce client-là aurait rencontré un avocat ou au moins on aurait commencé à processer le dossier. C'est là qu'on aurait vu les trous dans le dossier. Another company in Hong Kong, Globe Visa, had a unique solution for failed background checks by a second identity. 如果佢過唔到資產審查或者過唔到嗰個誒冒犯罪咧，咁佢就直接買護照噶啦。嗱，我哋做緊有七個護照嘅，而家。咁呢啲都係合法啊，同埋入入咗落嗰個移民法案嘅呢啲護照都係合規合法嘅護照嚟嘅呢啲。咁有兩本就係歐盟護照，咁誒另外有啲加勒比海嘅，咁加勒比海有五本。嗰啲唔係，唔得啦，佢係啦，嗰啲就加拿大。係啦係啦，嗰啲咧就係純粹係攞一個身份走佬嘅啫，即係有咩事或者係將筆資產隱形，即係譬如話你係陳生，咁你改做a second or a third identity in order to avoid disclosing information that could very well hide so many things. So many things. In a letter, Globe Visa says there is practically no chance that they would have taken Mr. Chen as a client. The scheme should be shut down. It doesn't work. Um, I, I can't see any way to make it work. Why hasn't it been shut down? It's because people are making a lot of money on, along the way. 
Ottawa dropped its own federal immigrant investor program in 2014 because it concluded it wasn't working. The Quebec government has known for years its program was rife with problems, largely ignoring them while keeping the money from these millionaire migrants. For The National, I'm Frédéric Zalak in Montreal. Still ahead on The National, a Nova Scotia community takes a new approach to managing stormwater by bringing a river back to the surface. We, we tread so heavy on the landscape as human beings. This is a small thing, but it's one small thing we, we've done here in Dartmouth to, to kind of fix something that we broke right back in the 1970s. People come from all over the place and they get on that mountain and fall head over heels. Oh, I gave it all I had and I ended up giving it just a little chip off of this tooth. A new episode of Still Standing, Tuesday on CBC. Okay, here's something you might not have thought a whole lot about. The environmental consequences of artificially submerging city rivers. <laughs> but it's a real issue, and, and stay with me here. Let's take the Sawmill River in Nova Scotia. It used to run through downtown Dartmouth, but for the past five decades, it's been trapped in a pipe below ground. But that won't work moving forward, which is why the community has been looking for a fix. And as Tom Murphy discovered, that means bringing the river back up to daylight. Ever wonder what lies beneath? Below our cities, it's like a secret world most of us never see. Running through a maze of pipes are rivers, buried against their natural will. And now, they want out. This is Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Nicknamed the City of Lakes, a place where people are naturally drawn to the water. I think it's something deeply rooted in us, right? You know, it seems to be where we want to go, we want to congregate. At the water's edge. At the water's edge, yeah. And Sam Austin is a former urban planner turned city councillor for the area. Water is not meant to be put into a pipe buried underground. That's such an artificial way to deal with it, right? It's meant to be above ground. That's where it's meant to be in the environment. But that's exactly what this city did. Bury the Sawmill River, a once vital waterway named for the sawmill that provided lumber to build Halifax in the 1700s. Long before that, a source of food and a transportation route for the Mi'kmaq people. So why bury it in the early 1970s? Well, at the time, it seemed the best response to a catastrophic flood. <music> 1971's Hurricane Beth was the stuff of Dartmouth legend. Austin wasn't even born back then, but he knows the stories. The Hawthorne Street gave way, and the dam that was here, it overtopped and the water just poured right through downtown Dartmouth, did a pile of damage, flooded a bunch of homes, took the bowling pins right out of the bowling alley and they floated off down the street. The engineers thought best try to manage the storm water in the future, stuff the river in a pipe, contain it, and sure, go ahead, build over it. And that's what they did. The idea in the 1970s was very much, you know, man versus nature. We can control this, we'll put it into pipes, we'll put it into channels. You know, kind of we look at it now as well, that was a bit of a mistake. The pipe did do its job, but it also stopped fish from traveling upstream. And now, old, rusty and due for replacement, it's also too small to handle a major modern day storm. All the development in the drainage basin, climate change, uh, all the projections were the pipe is not going to handle a repeat Hurricane Beth event. So it, it was actually a have to project, right? Because the alternative of doing nothing was going to be the bowling pins floating down Portland Street again. Portland Street is part of bustling downtown Dartmouth. The Sawmill River runs right underneath it. This is the best vantage to see where we'll have natural pond. So how do you control the water and solve the underlying pipe problem? One solution, release the river. It's called daylighting. That would mean tearing up this intersection to let the river flow. 
But this is a bit of a conundrum, isn't it? It is. This is hard to do, right? Because you've got an elevation change. You've got this six-story government building right here on the side that's right up against the property line. You've got limited space. You need a road to go through, and you need to get the water through. And ideally, we want to have a walking trail along it. So there's a lot, yeah, they're working on a feasibility study right now. Hmm. Okay. Well, even though they hadn't solved the riddle of the intersection that's halfway down the river, the city was so confident daylighting was the right solution, they decided to start at the top anyway and work their way down. They finished the first phase last spring, daylighting about 300 meters of the Sawmill River. It was left to engineers at the utility to make it happen. James Campbell is spokesperson for Halifax Water. When the project's underway, you have to pump the water that's flowing around the actual construction zone so the construction workers can actually do their work. It's not as easy as just putting a pipe in the ground. It's far more challenging. It's uh, much more of an engineering feat. Uh, it takes a little longer. The price tag for the first phase was $9 million. Six million of it came from Ottawa. But there was a catch. Department of Fisheries mandated that any solution here must provide passage for fish, including one species known as the Gasparo. This is the fish ladder, so the fish don't like a consistent flow, they like variation, and then the other piece is they like light. So uh, bringing the water up and creating this sort of environment for them, hopefully it'll be, the Gaspero will run through here again. To free this section of the trapped river took roughly five months. And now, short of a couple of places where it couldn't be avoided, the river babbles along from this pond, down the new fish ladder, under a street by a gas station, around some businesses. Even in this place, under this parking lot where the river isn't let out, grates let the light in. And it flows to here, halfway to Halifax Harbor. So what we're looking at here is going to be the transition point between the old and the new. So as you can see, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. That square part? That's the new, bigger, brighter passage. The lifespan for this, what's left, isn't very long, is it? it? Is not. And then there's the old pipe waiting to be removed. So the old system, or the system you see behind us, could handle roughly 18,000 uh, liters per minute. Up here, it's about 30,000, so significantly more, so quite a bit more uh, capacity to handle stormwater. A significant improvement once they figure out how to get around that intersection and those buildings just beyond. <laughs> Sounds daunting, but the entire daylighting project is forecast to be more cost effective than replacing the pipe and building a separate fish ladder. I just feel joy and pride in it. Right? To and Austin, I, I it's meant to be. Very few times that you have things really line up the way they did for this. You had the pipe needs to be replaced, we need to do stormwater, we've got federal money. Everything just kind of lined up just perfectly. And there's no question in his mind, the whole of the Sawmill River, banished underground for so long, will see daylight. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Really fascinating story. Okay, I, I do want to return to our top story this hour, the destructive path of a tornado that touched down today in the Ottawa area. Whoa! terrifying moments today as that tornado tore through parts of Ottawa and Gatineau. You can see here just how powerful that storm was as it passed through. And check this out, what was left behind. This is Dunrobin in the city's west end. As you can see, the destruction is extreme. According to the city, around 100 homes were damaged and we know that 30 people were hurt, five of them, seriously. A survivor of April's deadly Humboldt bus crash is learning that you don't need to wear a uniform to be on the same team. Case in point, Grayson Cameron's newest teammate, Chase, doesn't wear one. But then again, of course not. Chase is a one-year-old Labrador retriever given to Cameron by a First Nations service dog trainer to be his companion, one of three being donated to survivors to help them heal. The first meeting of these two teammates is tonight's moment. If you have a girlfriend, you have a girlfriend. don't you have a girlfriend? Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my. <laughs> There's a little bit of relief, I guess, kind of excitement, and it was just, uh, it was great to meet him. 
There's no getting away from that dog, buddy. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> I'm used to that team environment, and to have that relationship with, with a dog is means a lot to me. It'll be amazing just to have someone around all the time, and if I'm going through hard times or anything like that, you know, he'll he'll be right by my side. I think he's in love with you, Gene. Yeah, I'm in love with him. <laughs> And who wouldn't be? Chase, firstly, is a good name. Sounds like it comes from Paw Patrol. I, I know my Paw Patrol. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, it, Chase's job is to deal with anxiety and nightmares. And from what we understand from people who are in the room, you know, it was a bit of a hard day for Grayson. He was a, he was a bit apprehensive today. Uh, but once Chase was in there, the whole mood changed, which is yeah. the whole point. Well, I'm sure it was love at first sight. And just for the record, if my daughter had to say, I'm sure he'd... She'd name him Zuma. I think that's, that's her favorite. <laughs> but, uh, but it is funny to think that, I mean, he's got to prepare his life for a dog. I mean, that's the practical reality, right? Uh, they're, they're teammates, but, but housemates, too. Uh, that's The National for the September 21st. Good night. Good night.